Um, thank you everyone for taking the time to come and I'm privileged to have the opportunity to do this. And we're doing this grand rounds as, as part of uh, Mercy Medical Center's education efforts to get everybody on board in terms of what the Ebola outbreak is about, what the virus is and what we as a hospital are doing to make sure that our staff are protected. So I have Dr. Pearson here, I have Joan Rothwell from Infection Control, Diane Prykstad, Chris from uh, Risk Management, and if you have specific questions in relation to Mercy Medical Center, I think they're available to answer further questions, right? So I will be telling you about the virus. So I'm gonna get behind the computer and walk you through some specific things about the Ebola virus itself, okay? So this slide is actually from the New England Journal of Medicine. And it just walks you through different Ebola outbreaks. As you've probably heard, this outbreak in West Africa is not the first, but of course it's extremely different. So this, I don't take credit for this. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine. And you can access it yourself. It essentially shows you how this first outbreak started in 1970. The very first Ebola outbreak was in 1976. Maybe we'll skip this outbreak. I think I've gone through them enough to show you that there's been many outbreaks involving different countries. But what is different about this outbreak is that it now involves three countries. Um, it involves more people. And it involves people who live in major cities. In the past, outbreaks have involved small communities. And um, outbreaks have involved really small communities so that it involves less than 300 people. And with just a few infection control measures, they're able to control the outbreak. So this is a lot different than previous um, Ebola outbreaks. And then I want you to see the virus itself. This is the whole virus, the Ebola virus, and this is a picture of it cut through. Um, it's an RNA virus, and what that means is that when it inserts into the human cell, it instructs the human cell DNA to start producing a lot of its own DNA, and then it sort of acts like HIV where it instructs the cell what to do, but unlike HIV, it tells the cell to produce more polymerase and more DNA than it would ever need. So it tends to waste the resources of the human cell. So that's how it acts. This is the um, polymerase complex here. And then I also show you the nucleocapsid. And then this, these matrix proteins, the VP40 and um, VP24, they are responsible for attaching to the human cell and ideally, your immune system should be able to recognize these proteins and allow for antigen recognition and to for your own immune system to kick in. And what these proteins do is that they stop the production of interference. And so in a way, they fool your body and your body cannot mount up the right immune response. And ultimately, when the virus gets to the liver, it causes what is called a cytokine storm. And so over time, your body's like completely overwhelmed with not knowing what to do with this virus. So that was just a little bit about the virus. And then virus life cycle. It is thought that the Ebola virus comes from the fruit bat, but it's never been proven. It's just pure conjecture. And that is because the fruit bat has a virus that looks like the Ebola virus. It shares some antigens and stuff, but it's not the same. So all the story about, oh, maybe it came from monkeys or it came from bats, it's not proving. It's just pure conjecture. So I just want you to know that. But based on that theory, they think that the virus may either infect wild animals, and a lot of Africans like eating bush meat, sort of how people would hunt for deer and enjoy it here. People eat bush meat. So it's thought that when people eat bush meat or try to eat um, bats that they roast or grill, then the virus infects them and then you have human to human infection which also goes on to affect healthcare workers and in the community and that is why as i showed you before you'd find that there's been many outbreaks in um, mostly democratic republic of congo um, and actually right now even though there's an outbreak in west africa there's still a little 
small outbreak going on in Democratic Republic of Congo, but it's a lot different than the one going on in West Africa. So I'll close this and then start my actual PowerPoint. So I took this, I took this slide from last week's um, Economist magazine. Um, it talks about the war on Ebola, and they do a quite a nice uh, review of the economics of Ebola and how much money it's going to cost to try and actually control the virus, and I'll talk about it when I get there. So the objective of the lecture I already talked about, we, I wanted to share with you the nature of the virus, the pathophysiology, what it looks like, um, discuss the degree of transmission to healthcare workers, and also discuss facility preparedness to protect our staff. So um, each Ebola virus outbreak actually has a strain, meaning a, a, few, um, a few types of the virus that are different in one way or the other. This, so this just lists the different strains over the many years. Um, and actually, some of you might not know this, but in 1967, um, some researchers who were in Germany got some African monkeys from Uganda. They took them to their lab and they got sick with a hemorrhagic type virus and they called it the Marburg virus. So this sort of outbreak with viral infections is not new. But then it sometimes it allows people to question, is this something that we're doing with all these viruses and these primates that create these novel um, viruses? But nothing has been proven yet. So this particular virus is called the Zaire strain of the Ebola virus. Um, it's one of the most highly infectious and probably the most lethal virus known to man in that in most outbreaks, the mortality rate has ranged from 70 to 90%, well, 50 to 90%. So you have an infection where nine out of 10 people who get the infection are going to die. However, having said that, this mortality rate has been calculated in West Africa. In view of how Dr. Kent Brantley and um, nurse, the other nurse who came back to the U.S. survived, it looks like all the United States patients who came back to the U.S. got really good intensive care, survived. So it makes you question, is the mortality rate because patients are not being managed very well with fluid resuscitation? And not just all the ZMAP and the vaccines we're talking about, but from experience, it's been found that people are dying simply because of poor fluid management and not staying on top of their electrolytes and making sure they're getting all those transfusions that they need to have. So maybe that in the U.S., the mortality rate might not be 90% because we've had 100% survival of the five or, well, not to mention, well, Thomas Duncan is a little different, the one who came from Liberia. I think he was a little too ill to have survived. But this particular outbreak going on in West Africa, the mortality rate has been calculated at 70% just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we also know that before we had that first index patient who came to the United States, the thought was that patients are dying because the infrastructure and healthcare systems in West Africa are poor and um, they're not getting enough care. But we do know that when we got one patient in the United States, two healthcare workers got infected. And this was in the setting of the Centers for Disease Control looking on um, a hospital, which in my opinion is a pretty good tertiary institution. So what that tells us, and that's what that should tell you, is that when you're taking care of a patient with Ebola, it's extremely important that you put on the right equipment and you do not get secondarily infected. So initially when um, the first patient came to the United States, the thought was that almost every hospital would be able to take care of this patient. And I do agree in terms of fluid resuscitation. What we've come to learn is that yes, every hospital can take care of such a patient, but can every hospital take care of this patient safely so that other healthcare workers do not get infected in the process? So that's some of the things I'll be touching on. So this is an example of the fruit bat. Um, I just wanna move over here so those here can see me as well. So this is, an uh, this is a picture of the fruit bat, um, which is thought to harbor the virus, but I think this gentleman might be grilling it or something. I'm not sure, well maybe he's gonna have it for lunch. <laughs> and um, I already talked about the mode of transmission, fruit bat, um, different mammals. Somebody takes it for bushmeat for lunch and probably gets infected and it affects several organ systems. So 
we already did this interactive. So what happened with this current epidemic? And I'll just scroll through this and come back to it. So in on December 2nd, 2013, um, four deaths were reported from this small village here in Guinea, this particular town called Guakedu. And um, a two-year-old died, her mother died, and it looks like those who attended the funeral and several of those who handled the body also got infected and died. And as you could tell, Guinea borders shares a border with Sierra Leone and Liberia, which are now the hot zones for the infection. And in the past epidemics, the infection is in a small town, but as you could tell, this Guakudu it has a major road that leads back to Conakry, which is the capital town of Guinea, and there's a lot of transportation and stuff going on. So this child got infected and infected other people who lived in Liberia who were either part of the funeral or had visited them. And so that is what is thought to be the, the source of this current outbreak. So on March 3rd, March 23rd, this outbreak was reported by health officials. Um, samples were sent to Germany. But everybody is saying that that's when the World Health Organization should have acted up quickly in terms of controlling the infection. But they thought, well, this is just, we've heard of many Ebola outbreaks, over 20 of them. This is probably just going to be like every other Ebola outbreak. Unfortunately, it was different. So on August 8th, after almost several thousands of people had died, the World Health Organization declared it a public health emergency of international concern. Just a month later, they noted that now they had 4,500 cases and 2,200 of them had died. Another month later, it had doubled. So what we were seeing was like a doubling almost every month. Um, by November 2nd, which was two days ago, it was thought to have, would have reached 20,000. But fortunately, probably because of all the international efforts and all the help that is going on, it hasn't progressed as fast. But as healthcare workers, what hit me was that the healthcare health worker infection ratio was about 1 is to 20. What that means is that of the 8,400 people, 4,000 people who had died, over 400 of them were, um, 200 of them were healthcare workers. And you and I come to work every day. And actually, I think Ebola has really, really, I mean, I've, we've done infection control for a while, but this infection has made me rethink, you know, evaluating my patients and talking to them. Because we come to work every day and we know we're here to sacrifice. Of course, we get paid, but we also do it because we care about our patients. And you never think that as you take care of somebody, your life is literally on the line just by going to evaluate somebody. And I know they've talked about really, really close contact, but I'll share with you some stories of people who, you know, physicians who just lifted a patient, and then three or four days later, they had gotten infected and died. So this is an infection that puts your life on the line. And that's why I want you to understand it so that I want you to move from, oh, Ebola, maybe PPE, is the hospital ready? To if you came close face to face with an Ebola patient, you should think about your life, think about your family, and think about the people that you would be taking care of. So because there's a physician in Nigeria who took care of one patient like that and then infected other people because in a... I think for a brief moment, he was also in denial that he could really be sick. Um, so let me just, I think we've talked about this. Um, there were concerns about, I copied, I, I copied this from a website about a month ago, um, and the concern was that there was a quick doubling rate. Um, the green was the cases in Liberia cumulatively, red for Sierra Leone and Guinea, and you could tell that even though the outbreak started in Guinea, Liberia was becoming the hot zone, and it was thought that it was going to really double. But fortunately, in the last week, it hasn't doubled. But I don't want attention to shift from what's going on. And I gave three reasons why this outbreak is different. I don't know if you all remember. I'll say it, and I'll ask you again. It's not really part of a CME question. But main reason, it's in major cities instead of a small town. It involves three countries, and it involves places where people traveled a lot. So this is just another slide of the outbreaks, and I'm going to skip it real quick because um, we've gone over this. And as I said earlier, this Democratic Republic of Congo, they've had it since 1976, 77, and even this year, although people are not talking about it, they have a few cases there as well. But again, it's in a small town. So how is Ebola virus transmitted? And I'll just share lessons from the two patients who came to Emory University. 
what they found was that the virus, they had high viral load on the patient's skin. The three places they found a lot of flow of the virus though was blood, vomitus, and stools. So that if you were a nurse taking care of a patient, and when patients get Ebola virus, the second stage, they have diarrhea like every two hours. So I don't know if you've taken care of a malaria patient, but just imagine somebody who has malaria, who has cholera. They have a fever, their body is aching, and at the same time, they're vomiting all the time and going to the bathroom literally every two hours. Some of them, they just had to keep the potty by their bedside because they're going all the time. And these fluids, bodily fluids, are infected high, high viral loads. And so they found the virus on the skin. Somehow in Emory, they didn't find it on the body surfaces. I mean, on um, surfaces in the room, yeah, on the bed and stuff. And I'm assuming it's because they had such very good um, in fact, you know, everybody went in with their hazmats, the patients were supposed to be on their bed. So I think that the chances that they would find the virus on a surface was pretty little. But for an individual who is taking care of another Ebola patient, it gets to you through the eyes, mucous membrane, and sometimes even intact skin, even though they said non-intact skin. And again, I'm just going purely by the pathophysiology of how people get abscesses. I think we get a lot of micro perforations that we don't even consider or we don't see because in they're in the micro millimeter, um, micrometer dimension. And so I can see how a virus that's also extremely small, about a thousand times smaller than a micro millimeter, can get into a, your intact skin and then cause infection. Because those two nurses who took care of Thomas Duncan who got ill, Apart from a few exposed areas, it sounds like they had done everything that they were told to do, right? I don't know if you were following the story. So it gets into the body, gets into monocytes, essentially the immune cells, and then goes into the liver adrenal glands, and finally into the liver spleen. And in the liver, it stops production of coagulation factors. Essentially, in the end, a patient who is dying from Ebola virus has DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulation. Okay, so from a medical standpoint, some of the laboratory findings include leukopenia, um, low platelet counts, patients going to uh, develop pancreatitis, um, liver enzymes are elevated, they start excreting a lot of protein in their urine, and um, they have a picture of DIC. So what are the symptoms? Um, I would go over them, go back and forth a little bit, but initially somebody who has been infected with Ebola would have a sudden onset of fever, and that's why if you've been following the New York physician, he went bowling, et cetera, on that day. I think he rode a bike, and then he noted he had a temp of 100.3. So patients, after an incubation period of about 2 to 21 days, patients will develop a sudden onset of fever. So some of you are sleeping. I'm going to ask you the three reasons why Ebola is... <laughs> There are reason, three reasons why this outbreak is different, if I find you those. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the sudden onset of fever and flu-like symptoms, and then days four to seven, the vomiting and diarrhea set in. So um, I'm not violating HIPAA, because this physician is on the news. So the New York physician, for example, a few days ago, they told us he was in critical condition and that he had entered the gastrointestinal phase of his illness where he was probably going to the bathroom every two hours. And they said the, the stool looks like um, cholera stool. It's white. Um, it's not brown. It's a lot of just li li fluids leaving the body. Um, patients develop low blood pressure. And then I'm calling this the point of no return. It's not in any textbook. But um, finally, you get to that cytokine storm stage where patients get confused. And at autops autopsy, for those who of you who are pathologists, they say when you dissect all the organs, it almost looks like every organ is bleeding, literally, because they have um, DIC. And during this phase of illness, patients will become comatose. They start acting weird. And some people would think they're acting on purpose. For example, the librarian who went to Nigeria, during the last days when he was about to die, he started acting erratically. He threatened the hospital staff, you know, after he was told he had Ebola. And he actually took out his IV, so the blood spilled on one of them. He really wanted to leave against medical advice and so forth. So as to whether that was part of his illness, you know, the confusion stage, or he was acting purposefully is unclear. But 
those are the stages of Ebola virus infection until finally they become comatose and die. And if you have a question at this point, I would take it. Any pathology question? Okay, so these are some of the skin findings that would occur at the very la late stages. So how do you diagnose somebody with Ebola virus? Initially, you have to think about it, and that's why they've p we've posted, at least most hospitals have been asked to post that, ask for a history of travel to Liberia or any specifically any of the three countries that have been affected, and that should give you a clue. Of course, the lab abnormalities I talked about, and then the ultimate test is testing for polymerase chain reaction for finding the presence of the virus in the blood. There's also an ELISA test for IgG and IgM. And I know a researcher in Louisiana was, was going to come up with a test that would just use a small amount of blood, like a pinprick, and be able to have the test ready in, in 15 minutes. But currently, all the tests have to go to CDC to be done. And I know as of last week, I have been updated information. I don't have updated information today, but the CDC was going to allow five states to run the PCR tests. Um, one was Illinois, one was Minnesota. So we could also take our test there versus sending it to Atlanta. Um, these are the different times during the illness when you could use the different um, tests. Within a few days, ELISA virus isolation PCR and late in the disease or after recovery, you could do IgG and IgM. I actually read a, 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 an interesting article about a lady who said she was either the first Ebola patient or the first Marburg virus patient. She, w she traveled to Africa many years ago, came back ill, and nobody really knew till afterwards when they tested her blood and found that she was ill. And she didn't infect anyone. So she's one of the people that, um, those who want to argue for, be calm about it, are saying this woman came back, nobody knew she had a hemorrhagic viral illness and she didn't infect anybody too. Okay, so based on what I'll, I'll just talk about, is close contacts really necessary? So this gentleman here is probably well known to most of you. They've talked about him at length. He was a Liberia, well, a Liberian American. His family lives in the US, but he does business in Liberia. So his sister, was pregnant. And for those of you who are OBGYNs, one of the presentation for Ebola virus is just miscarriage. Those who are pregnant, they just start bleeding, so they think they're losing their baby, but really it's Ebola virus infection. So his sister got ill, she started bleeding, and they thought she was losing her baby. She, he went to visit her at the hospital, helped to take care of her, and according to hospital reports, he had blood all over him. Unfortunately, his sister died, and the test came back positive for Ebola virus. And he was told to be on watch for 28 days. He texted his employer, and apparently even they have documents showing the disseminated information in the company that this gentleman has Ebola virus, he shouldn't travel. But he had a part-time job as a financial consultant for the Liberian Ministry of Finance. And there was a conference in Conakry, in, um, in um, Calabar, and he really wanted to go. So. Some, I don't want to comment on the internal details, but he was allowed to fly. By the time he got to the airport, he was so sick that his escort took him straight to the hospital. To cut a long story short, that escort died just by keeping him in his car. And of course, maybe he helped him a little bit. I don't know how ill he was, but the escort also died from Ebola virus infection. And when he got to the hospital, he denied any, that he didn't know anybody who had Ebola and he had never taken, you know, come into contact with an Ebola patient. So for the first two days, they took care of him as a patient with malaria, checked his HIV until the third day when this physician said, you know what, this guy is from Nigeria, I'm from Liberia, let's test him for Ebola virus. By that time, apparently the Liberia Ministry of Health were giving the hospital a lot of pressure to discharge him so he could go for his conference. And um, I read some, <laughs> no, seriously, I read some of this from the reports of this, this girl. She was the, well, this woman, she's a, she was a house officer on call. She said that there was a lot of pressure to discharge him to go for his conference. And this woman said, you know what? She, he is not leaving this hospital because we think he has Ebola virus infection. Anyway, so what happened with him? He infected 20 people. Um, six of whom died, including the physician who was able to insist that this patient should stay in the hospital. 
Um, the nurse who got blood on her hands died. And this I read a, a couple of days ago, I found interesting. One of the patients who was put on quarantine left and went to another part of Nigeria called Port Harcourt. I'm sure you are familiar with those areas very well, right? He went to Port Harcourt and went and stayed in a hotel. And it turns out that the hotel physician also didn't know that this patient had um, Ebola virus. So they also talk about the Port Harcourt cases. The physician got ill and died. The, you know, the hotel physician, he died. And two of his contacts died as well. So the one who ran away from quarantine got ill and died. And of course, I'm not here to discuss quarantine, but it brings to mind some of the issues that have been in the media. Should patients who've taken care of, should healthcare workers who've taken care of patients with Ebola be on quarantine? I won't comment on that because it's kind of a political thing, but you can, you know, based on what I'm saying, you make up your own mind. So um, <laughs> um, this, this physician got ill and died. Two of his contacts died as well. And he infected other people. They, but Nigeria did something really heroic. Um, they they um, activated their um, incident command center. And they did something really well delineated. They had a case management unit, epidemiology surveillance unit, social mobilization, lab services, point of entry, uh, management and coordination. They had people who were been assigned to manage rumors manage clinical care decontamination. They had people who were monitoring the borders. People traveled to Port Harcourt to go and make sure that they had done contact isolation. And because of that, here is what they did. Lagos has a population of 21 million. Can you imagine what would have happened if they had a Ebola outbreak? I mean, a lot of people would have died, but they were able to contain the illness. Um, only six people, well, not only, six people died. 894 contacts were traced. They had 18,500, I mean, face-to-face -face visits, and they visited 26,000 households. That's the extent they went to make sure that one patient, one, so all it takes is one, that, that one patient did not cause an outbreak in Nigeria. Um, th what they also did at the hospital was that that day, everybody in the hospital went home. So imagine Mercy Medical Center we get one case of Ebola and everybody is discharged home. They sent everybody home and the hospital was disinfected. And today, it, today as I speak, the hospital is filing a lawsuit against the Liberia, you know, whoever, the official that was insisting that, because out of that, their pathologist died, their anesthesiologist died, and they're only, probably the only endocrinologist that, you know, that woman also died. Um, there have been no more reports of cases in Nigeria since then. So this woman died. I really admire her for her courage, and people think she should get she should be honored for saving the nation. Um, this nurse was the one who got blood on her hands. She died. This lady here did not die. She survived, but she told the story of how everybody who was ill was kept in one isolation unit. They did not assign 76 staff to them like ha it happened in Texas. Only one physician went in for the first three days. He gave them their food, pulled their IVs, examined them, went in full hazmat. And it was after they, they started getting better that other providers were allowed to take care of these ill patients. And everybody who was ill was kept in one hospital. They didn't put them all over the country. Um, so I just mentioned this, patient, this gentleman too. He was 74 and I think he probably should have retired. He had survived the Liberia war. Um, he didn't leave when Liberia had the war. He was a grandfather, and he's the director of the emergency, um, emergency department in the hospital where he worked. And the hospital hadn't had Ebola virus before, but they brought this patient with a confirmed case of Ebola. And what he and another physician did were just to lift him up because the gentleman was too weak to take him to an isolation unit. Three or four days later, he was sick, and he also died. So he survived several wars, but could not survive um, Ebola virus infection. This other physician, he was only 39. He was the, like the main Ebola physician in Sierra Leone. He chose to take care of hundreds of patients with Ebola. He convinced them, come, we can take care of you. Don't be afraid. He was interviewed by several media. You know, how are you going to protect yourself? He said, I wear my gown. I have a mirror to check myself. Unfortunately, he fell ill, and I found out later that he was the first patient they were considering using the ZMAP on 
but they went back and forth and they weren't sure if it would cause some major harm, but unfortunately he also succumbed. So I want you to put, what I'm trying to do is allow you to put your shoes in the lives of these people so that when you have a patient and you have to make a decision, it's not just, okay, what is Mercy saying we should do? Are we supposed to put on this, ma this mask or should we take, it's more of, you know what, I understand this virus. I understand that if you're not extremely careful, you could get infected and pass it on. And I hope I'm trying to, I hope I'm achieving that purpose. Am I doing that? Yeah. Okay, all right. So, and again, that brings put to mind Dr. Ken Brantley. He was a physician, he accepted a job to be a medical director at an Ebola treatment unit. So he went voluntarily, he only said, keep my wife and kids back home. Am I talking too much? Okay, keep my <laughs> wife and kids back home. I'm gonna go and take care of this patient. And he was interviewed on CNN last, a couple weeks ago, and he told Anderson Cooper, I did everything right. Not a centimeter of my skin was exposed. However, he believes that he may have gotten infected maybe in the community or something else because he did everything he was supposed to do because he knew the risk. This is an Ebola treatment unit. I could die. Fortunately, I think his life was saved by coming, bringing him back to the US. Although I was very nervous when they were coming back, in retrospect, it was a good decision. Um, his, he's, he's helped to save many lives because they've donated his plasma over and over and over again. This nurse, she was the hygienist. She was the one who was supposed to make sure that after they put on their gowns and they were taking it off, they were doing it the right way, sp spray the bleach and whatnot. Unfortunately, she also got infected. So I just want to do this to illustrate that, you know, this is a virus that you should be very careful about. And then we also know about the Catholic priests who were evacuated back to Spain. Unfortunately, one nurse assistant got infected and thankfully she has survived. Um, Germany also had a few patients evacuated back. Actually, they offered to WHO that I think they'll take their healthcare workers who get ill. Unfortunately, one of them died in Leipzig. I think so far, United US has been the most successful at um, treating Ebola patients. So this was just to show you that Ebola has been all over the world, mostly from here um, to Spain, Netherlands, and a few other countries. It's not clear on this, but I just wanted to show you this. And until travel can be halted from Liberia, which is not realistic, I don't think we should forget about it. We shouldn't stop planning because we don't have an active case here. All it takes is one person who doesn't have symptoms, and Thomas Duncan didn't have any symptoms when he was leaving Liberia. Neither did Mr. Patrick Sawyer, the gentleman who died in Nigeria. He didn't have any symptoms, or at least it was not reported <laughs> until he got to his destination. So let's talk about Thomas Duncan very briefly. Um, he left Liberia on September 19th. Story is that he had taken care of a pregnant woman or either taken them to the hospital or helped them get into a cab. Um, he was in the U.S. for five days. He went to a hospital. He told them his history that he was from Liberia. And I think it didn't quite click to whoever took the history. Went home, came back on September 28th. Two days later, the test came back positive. And what we learned from him, his situation too, is that the first two days while the tests were being done, apparently, I don't think they took care of him with um, gowns and the right protection. And the story is told, according to the workers, I don't have any proof that for several hours he sat in an emergency room with other patients without any um, actual protection. So he died on October 8th. Um, and this is just my personal opinion. I remember the day that you know CDC and the Texas Healthcare got on t national television that they could take care of this, they could handle it. My feeling was, wow, that's a lot of overconfidence on their part because I would be rushing them to one of the four biocontainment units. Unfortunately, the p he, he went on dialysis and he was reported dead. The other lessons we learned from it is that if you take care of an Ebola patient, you should be monitored. And it turns out that the 76 or so people who took care of him, you know, they were kind of let go because they thought they had worn the right gowns. Um, to my understanding, the two nurses who secondarily got infected, they called of their own volition. It wasn't like they were told to be on the lookout for Ebola symptoms. So those are things that we can learn. And I also understand that the... the Ambulance that took him to the hospital, you know, it wasn't, it didn't go through any routine cleaning. So for a couple of days, they were picking other patients with that same ambulance. So I think the city has designated one ambulance for possible 
Ebola virus. And based on what the CDC is now doing, I don't think we might even have a patient on our doorsteps because everybody who comes from West Africa or any of these three countries is screened at the airport. You're given a number to call and your information is sent to the state that if you do have a fever and it sounds like you're developing Ebola, please don't rush to the emergency room. Call the state so that someone can be sent to your home and evaluate you because from the Nigeria situation, one patient led to 19 infections. So essentially CDC or we, should, we don't want people just rushing to the emergency room and infecting a whole lot of people. The less contacts they have with other healthy patients, the better. Um, and then the other lesson that, the, I think the biggest lesson to that Thomas Duncan, I don't know why he came here, but I think he's been a good teacher for the US health, you know, healthcare system, was the rhetoric from CDC that every hospital can take care of an Ebola patient. And I think that has changed. And two months ago, John, you remember, I kind of said, I don't agree. I told the Sioux City Journal afterwards, I was like, what have I said? CDC <laughs> said every hospital, but I kind of knew deep down that, you know what? You can't let every hospital take care of an Ebola patient. And I think that has changed and the states are being encouraged. And Iowa, for example, is going to be encouraged to designate a hospital that if you have a suspected patient, you can take them to that hospital. And the CDC will now send a a, a team of people to make sure that everything is being done right at the institution. Um, so our response as an organization is that we formed an Ebola preparedness team with management and several people from um, environmental nursing and we came up with a plan on what to do. Um, this is a sign in the ER telling patients that if you have this, report this to the receptionist. Um, we have this in the ER as well, Joan, right? And we have made the sign that we would potentially use. We haven't had to use it yet. And the precautions are droplets. And this is a, this is a letter we sent out to physicians as well. And the precautions are contact and droplet. But in the four biocontainment units, and as you would see on TV, um, there's a lot more than just contacts. These four biocontainment units make sure that they have airborne um, negative, airborne precautions with negative pressure as well. Um, and I also want you to think about what's going on in West Africa. It's one thing for the United States to just think about our staff, our hospitals, and let's get our PPEs, but I also want your mind to go back to what's going on in Africa. Um, as of three weeks ago, when there were 900 cases a week, Guess how many beds these three countries have? Hospital beds. Just, if you've heard this lecture before, don't say it. <laughs> three countries combined. Just guess. You, I mean, you could be wrong. You could be right. <laughs> well, two pretty, they have 600 and some, 650 beds or so between the three countries. You know, hospital beds. And this is happening in a, in a continent where they have a million deaths from HIV every year, 500,000 deaths from malaria, and you have a lot of pregnant women too needing access to beds. So the U.S. promised to build 1,700 bed units. I don't even think that's going to be enough. These units take a month to build. So until we control the infection in these three countries, we would still have to keep being on our toes. So I want you to think about it. Um, civic society is disrupted in Sierra Leone. Schools are closed, and you can imagine the effects it will have many years down the road. Their gross domestic product, which was estimated to be 11%, is now down to 2%. People have abandoned their farms because they're afraid of getting infected. And um, John Kerry summarized this well when he was talking about U.S. giving money to get these centers built. He said, if we don't handle Ebola virus and outbreak properly, Ebola virus could become like HIV, which has become endemic. At this point, we don't know who has it. A few people, you know, have been tested, but we've never, as a, as a, as a world and WHO said, you know what, this week we're giving everybody an HIV test. We want to know who has it and who doesn't. You know, we haven't done that to HIV. Could it become endemic? Um, the only difference is HIV takes 15 to 20 years to kill. This would take 20, 10 days or less to, um, to kill you. So personal protective equipment, the recommendations, they've taken the goggles out because they think it produces too much heat around the eyes, but double gloves, impervious full body suits, plastic boots, shoe covers, head, 
covers. And the key thing is that when you're taking care of a, pa a patient with Ebola, no part of the skin should be exposed. This was a picture of one of the physicians who took care of the two healthcare workers in Emory University. And I have a little bit more to talk about in terms of our facility preparedness. Um, the fact that you should always use a buddy to observe you putting on the gown and taking them off. If you have a unit that you've identified to be used for Ebola, you should have a separate area for putting on gowns and a separate area for taking them off. You should dispose of them well as a community. You need to think of where you're going to bury Ebola patients, how you're going to transport them, get rid of the body. And uh, I think this is not a recommendation from a body per se, but I think that each hospital should have a standby staff, maybe a phlebotomist, a critical care person, an anesthesiologist, and a dialysis person who has been trained and will be ready to take care of at least preliminary until they're moved to an Ebola hospital, people who would be ready to and know what to do, been trained over and over again in taking care of an Ebola patient. There's a couple more slides, but I'll stop here so that if you have questions, I'm sure some of them will lead into the, um, the other slides that are left. And there's the infection control, quality risk, VP of medical affairs, so please direct your questions to them as well. Is the viral shedding, okay. So that is a question that as an infectious disease specialist, I kind of struggle with a little bit in terms of, again, a statement that goes out that, well, um, if patient doesn't have symptoms, they're not infected. I, anytime I hear that, I go, how can you prove that? It's a nice rhetoric for the public. It's a nice rhetoric to get people to feel safe. And we know that, like, take this, um, the, 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 the gentleman who flew from Liberia to Nigeria, he sat in a plane, nobody in the plane got ill. And so the thought is that maybe if you're not ill enough and you're not vomiting and having diarrhea and all that, you w you, the, power of the, the power for you to transmit the infection is much, much less, okay? The two nurses who got secondarily infected, one of them sat in a plane to um, somewhere in Ohio. We've never heard of any secondary cases. She went and tried on wedding gowns and all that. Um, nobody had secondary infections. So even though the virus could be on your skin, it does not seem to spread. What we do know is that towards the end stages of the illness, you know, that second and third, well, second stage, a lot of diarrhea and vomiting, but that last stage when they're comatose, uh, comatose and getting all confused, their viral loads are really high, and so trans transmission of infection is higher. It's possible that during the early stages, the viral load is very small. And maybe that's why infection is not efficiently transmitted that way. And Bertha, to that same statement, uh, one of the things we've learned with uh, evaluations of patients in the States is exactly that, that when patients come in initially, and you do your PCA tests and so forth, PCR, they, uh, it's very likely that if you catch them early on in their illness, the viral load is low enough where it may test negative. Whoa. And so you have to be careful that if someone comes in with the right travel history, right exposure, they test negative and they're not symptomatic, that you don't just say they don't have the they disease. They don't have the you disease. Have to wait a couple of days, 48 hours, and then we test. Sort of like acute HIV where all the tests might be negative, like the first five days or so, and then down the road they test positive. Those, those two days, do you totally isolate them at yes. that point in time? They're treated as other positive until you get a confirmatory test. If we were to have them here, they would go elsewhere, though. Is that what we're also saying? Well, at this point, Iowa hasn't identified a place to take them, and all hospitals have been asked to be ready because, you know, you can't have a sign in the ER that says, you know, once you think they have Ebola, you should send them somewhere. So at least every facility has to be ready with a room and staff to take care of the patient until they're stabilized. Because if, if they're in the first two stages of the illness, they can actually sit or just lay in the bed. They're not crashing. So you should be ready, but I don't think as of now we've identified somewhere to take them. But fortunately, one of the four units, the biocontainment units, is just 100 miles away from here. But it doesn't mean that we can just, you know, pick up a phone and say we're bringing the patient. Because although that unit has 10 beds, they said like psychologically and mentally and everything, they can only take care of two Ebola patients at a time. So does that answer your question? Okay. 
Okay, any other questions? Did the hospital in Texas almost have a huge uh, exodus of patients afterwards? I read that in the Wall Street Journal. I don't know for sure. I don't know. Yes. In Africa, don't they actually have them stand over like a gravel pit and just shower them down with that I don't know about gravel pit, but I think that. Doctors and doctors without borders have excellent websites on this, and they have people outside, and they're actually closed down, and then they leave you there. Yeah, you should be pretty aggressive because even in the biocontainment units, when I went there, what they were saying was that all the sophistication I see is as good as the the person who is taking off their gown. If they don't take it off well, the staff at the nursing station could get infected. And whoever is watching them remove their gowns could also get infected. So they put everything in a biohazard bag and tie it up and throw it away. Well, they do this outside with the gravel, and they just shower them with bleach water. Um, no. Oh, you mean the biocontainment unit? No, no, no. To be honest, I don't know a whole lot about how they do. Oh, Nigeria, they only had one patient, and he died. They got rid of the... They, they were able to bury him very well because as I showed you they had a burial you know unit as part of their response system but they didn't have a lot of pay you know they didn't have to be taking care of a lot of patients and be showering it was one main hospital where they put all their patients to the 19 patients who were infected but that's the recommendation that if you're taking off your gown your gloves should have bleach wipes on it before you throw them away. Because you don't just want to throw those gloves away. They could infect somebody else. So I think that what you're asking is cultural adaptation. Whatever works in your, in, if uh, those of you who've been to Africa, some of the hospitals are not extremely sophisticated. So if they have to dig a gravel pit and let someone stand in it to shower down, that's what it may be. I don't think you can duplicate it. Because believe me, the sophistication in a place uh, just 100 miles apart is extremely different. You can have a tertiary hospital with government funding, which has enough sophistication. And then just 50 miles down the road, you'd have a little, you know, small place that takes care of only 10 people. So you can like blanket Africa into one um, this is what they do in every place. Well, actually, two of the main uh, organizations that deal with them is Samaritan's First and Doctors Without Borders, mm -hmm. both of which are dealing with all of that. So that's, that, that's what they're doing? Correct. Okay. Having taken a camp shower, it's not fun, uh, but it's actually doable. It's doable. And it's much more effective mm -hmm. than a full joy. I hope you're all listening. He's sharing something important about what Doctors Without Borders is doing on the ground. What we have here in place, we have, there's several institutions. Emory is one that we've looked at as far as their PPE and preparedness. And part of the process of doffing or removing the gown does include wiping down all the areas with bleach wipes. Um, we go through a six pairs of gloves during that process of taking off the gear. There's a certain pattern and sequence of putting on and taking off the gear. Uh, they all actually have disposable scrubs and disposable underwear, which is gorgeous. <laughs> people use, and then they do shower down even after they've gone through the full hazmat gear on and off, scrubs on and off, everything from the skin out, and then they shower, and that whole area is disinfected. So it's not bleached water, but on every exposed surface, if there's anything that looks like there's soil on the PPE, that's wiped down in bleach. Uh, before you do anything, you scrub your hands with alcohol-based cleanser. Then you take off a layer of gloves and you scrub again. Then you put on this and you scrub again. So you constantly, there's the cleaning process that goes on to, in some degree, replicate what you're talking about. Because the virus can stay on surfaces for several weeks. And for those patients who get discharged, it's in their semen for several weeks as well. So they're counseled on um, abstinence and condoms and whatnot. So does that, uh, anyway, thank you for the contribution that you gave. You gave a personal perspective. I'm sorry. I think you should put a tent up. <laughs> a tent up. Well, that's what they were doing in Sierra Leone. Except, except we have winter coming. But I think it's very sensible because the Emory unit it's not in the hospital, it's kind of an outside, um, it's another building away from their regular, where they take care of patients. Right? It's not, it's not a, it's not, I think that's a good idea. If, if it was summer, for example, 
we could put a tent. It would imp I think patients will be less fearful if they're coming to the hospital. They know that you know, the patients with Ebola are somewhere else versus inside the hospital. We actually did talk about that. Mm -hmm. About having <laughs> tents are using the, air, the hangar down at the 185th or something. It depends on the degree of uh, patient volumes that we get. But there, we've discussed both at the hospital, both hospitals, as well as at the county level. And we have a call with the state, and we'll be discussing all these things with them as well. So all those things, you know, they may sound a little ridiculous. All those things are on the table. We've talked about all of it, and none of it is none of it's a silly question. None of it is out of the pocket. I mean, anything that we have to do to protect our staff and our patients and the community, that's what we're going to do. Okay. So if you have more, but let me. I just have three slides. The other things they did in most of these biocontainment units, and even in some parts of Africa, if they can. Actually, the first Ebola outbreak, the ones who managed it in 1976, they discussed their experience last week in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what they did is a point of care lab where they take everything they would need for the patients right to the bedside or to the unit so they're not trans, you know, trans, transporting blood across the hospital. So do everything right there and analyze your results. And I didn't mention this earlier, but when the two healthcare workers came back, they said for one week, no blood work had been done. They were hyponatremic, hypokalemic, they were in atrial fibrillation, they were dehydrated. So a lot had to be done. So taking care of patients with Ebola requires frequent monitoring of blood counts and electrolytes to be able to take care of them. Um, and I, it's good we're talking about hospital preparedness, but as you can tell, with what happened in Nigeria, it's going to take a whole healthcare system preparedness the emergency department, um, the uh, EMT system getting EMS. EMS getting prepared, public health information and good communication, um, clinics being aware of what to do, funeral homes knowing what to do, um, and having a designated burial ground even in Sioux City for where we would potentially bury uh, uh, a, uh, an Ebola infected patient and how to stop the epidemic in West Africa, early diagnosis, contact tracing, infection control, and safe burial. Because Africans love, you know, burials. It's like the major, a major social event. They keep bodies for two months. And when my father died, he was kept for like three months waiting for everybody to get ready and everybody wants to pay their respects. And so it's part of the cultural fiber of the, pe you know, of the people. You can't just tell them to stop it. But this, in this case, they're asking them, if somebody with Ebola dies, they're getting zipped up in a bag and they're taking them to a specific place. So some of the cultural practices in the, in the places where they've been infected. Actually, I think the outbreak started because the burial practices were not done right. At least that's what everybody's saying. If they had buried that little girl and her mother well and not done a big funeral, it probably wouldn't have spread to um, where it is now. Um, patient isolation, infection control, and I think that's the end of my lecture. If you have other questions, I'll be happy to answer them.